Good morning, it's Supernal Magazine, Australia Radio Time, and uh, you're here with Anthony Kilner, our editor of Supernal Magazine. We also have our content editor, Shirley Sienna, joining us from the Mornington Peninsula. Good morning, Shirley, how are you? Good morning, Anthony. I'm not too bad, thank you, today. Yeah. All things Shirley considered. Morning. Yeah, All no, things it's a good day. Uh, we have a very special guest today joining us uh, all the way from uh, America at the moment. And we'll get details about where they are living at, uh, in a minute. But um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nicholas Rebush to the show. And um, we have, you have an amazing story, uh, Nick, and we're going to delve into that a little bit. But I just want to say thank you for joining us uh, all the way over from Lincoln in America. Well, uh, yeah, thank you, Anthony and Shirley. It's uh, very kind of you to uh, invite me onto the show, and I'm uh, delighted to be here. Mm, no, it's great. Well, we, um, in, in the last couple of issues, or well, the last issue of the magazine, and in the current one we're working on, we've been looking at a whole lot of different topics around reincarnation, past lives, uh, that sort of thing. And in this issue that we're working on, which is the May issue, we are looking at uh, WESAC or Buddha's birthday as an important um, day in the calendar for May. And so we'd like to talk to you about that because you're very connected. And for our listeners out there, uh, Nicholas uh, is a monk. And, um, and that journey from doctor back in Melbourne uh, in, in the 64, when you, I think, got through Melbourne Uni as a doctor. So take us through that journey from M M Melbourne boy to doctor to living in Queensland and then heading overseas. Oh, gosh, that's uh, a long story and a long time ago. First, I would point out I'm, I was only a monk for 12 years, uh, from 74 to 86. Uh, Otherwise, you'd see me with a shaved head and wearing robes like um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but, um, you know, getting ordained and then after 12 years disrobing is a story within a story too. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was, I was born in Melbourne in 1941 uh, and, uh, you know, had a fairly... Uh, quiet, normal, middle-class upbringing, I guess. My parents were actually um, immigrants, the Russian, Russian Jews from Latvia, and they came to Melbourne in the middle to late 30s. Um, and uh, so in the early days, um, in fact, until I started going to, to school, uh, we spoke main, mainly Russian at home. I didn't speak that much English until I went to school. Um, they tell me, I can't remember. Um, and so and so we grew up in, it was a sort of a European vibe in the house and all their friends were uh, uh, Russians or, uh, you know, classical music and opera lovers, uh, which I took quite a dislike to, the, that sort of entertainment, I mean. And, um, uh, so the first two or three years, I went to a girls' school, Strathcona Baptist Girls' Grammar School in Canterbury, which was just a few blocks walk from our house uh, in Canterbury. And uh, then after that, I went to Scotch College for 10 years. And uh, then I, I think when I was 14 or 15, I decided to uh, study medicine. I think partly influenced by my father, who... Um, himself had wanted to be a doctor, but uh, somehow his uh, plans were disrupted by, um, uh, I don't know, some kind of war in Europe, I forget now. And uh, so when, when he got through with the, uh, being with the Russian army, he studied economics, but he always had this wish to be a doctor. And I think that uh, brushed off on me and my younger brother who also graduated from Melbourne University Medical School um, uh, in 68. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so I went to Melbourne Uni, started in 59, 
and I was at a friend's place in in a few a uh, few blocks away, um, one in fifty eight, and um, and it was around that time uh, my father died. He had a heart attack and uh, died when I was in my last year at Scotch, and um, uh, I was at my friend's place and his sister played uh, a record of the Dutch Swing College uh, traditional jazz band, and that really blew my mind. I, that was, I'd never heard that music before and I, I really uh, got off on it. Uh, so, so my friend's sister said, oh, well, if, you're, if you like this, you should go and listen to this um, uh, music live. And there was um, the Melbourne Jazz Club uh, mm -hmm. at that time was briefly down in Burnley, uh, you know, near Richmond. And it was right on our tram line down Riversdale Road. Um, so, you know, on one of the Fridays soon after that, uh, my friend and I went to the Melbourne Jazz Club and we walked into this old uh, church hall, St Mary's Church Hall, and, um, and there was this band playing in, on the, on, there was a sort of a riser at the front of the hall and there, there were all these pews lined up with people just sitting there listening to the music and it was all kind of smoky and there was this kind of cone uh, light was the only light over the stage and there are a few people in the back dancing and you know I I just listening to this music I sort of felt I mean I didn't describe it as that then but it's like my heart chakra opened and it was like what I call my first religious experience you know and uh, so you know I immediately wanted uh, to play this music uh, my mother had made me learn the piano from the age of about six to 13 and classical music, and I really didn't like it. So uh, when I was old enough to assert myself, I sort of said, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, so as a last ditch effort, she sent me to a guy called Roy Sparks, who, who lived near us, and he was teaching, you know, learn modern piano playing. So I learned a little bit about sheet music and, and playing chords from those eight lessons I took from him. But when that course finished, I, I stopped playing. So at the back of the hall selling records uh, was a guy who lived three doors up from us, as it happened. Uh, his, his name was Neville Sherburn, and he ran Swaggy Records, uh, which was the Australian record label that specialised in traditional jazz. And uh, he also played piano in a band uh, uh, that he had, uh, Port Phillip Jazz Band or something, it wasn't very well known. So he showed me kind of the rudiments of playing um, piano as sort of as part of the rhythm section really uh, in, in the band. So when I got to uni, um, uh, there was another guy, Mike Martin, who lived two doors away from my friend where I first heard the music. He, he played modern jazz drums and uh, he was the secretary of the jazz club at the university that was called the Rhythm Club. And, uh, he asked, they had record sessions twice a week. So um, he asked me if I'd do the traditional jazz record sessions on Mondays. So, um, so I said, okay. And the, they had quite a big collection of 78s at, at the university, but then I started collecting records myself. And at these um, uh, sessions, there were some guys who played, who played instruments. There was a trumpet player, trombone player, a banjo player, and they were all med students too. Uh, two of them were in my year, one, the banjo player, Bob Atkins, who then who became a big professor of nephrology later. Uh, he played banjo and then an art student called Mike Lockhart played clarinet. So we put a band together, we called Melbourne University Jazz Band. And uh, so all through uni, I played in this band. We did some, uh, uh, we did some gigs at the uni and, uh, a couple of friends and I started a jazz club in North Baldwin that went for about a year. And then we played down at Lawn at the Wild Colonial Club uh, one summer in uh, 60, 61. And then we made a record, uh, a seven inch EP for W and G in early 61. So, you know, so that was really a lot of fun um, playing music as, as well as being a med student. But then, uh, you know, in 62, 63, there came the Beatles and uh, Rolling Stones, and then the whole musical thing world changed for us. 
Um, and I, I kind of got into that music anyway and stopped playing. Um, so then I graduated and I worked for, uh, I was a student at Prince Henry's Hospital and I graduated and worked there for a couple of years. Then I did a year at the Heidelberg Repat, uh, sort of a nine to five, uh, um, call it a gap year. And then I went back to Prince Henry's as a medical registrar. And then I decided to specialize in kidney disease. So then I went to do work in the University Renal Unit at the Royal Melbourne with, uh, under Priscilla Kincaid Smith. And uh, that was in 69. And um, I, I re really didn't like research. It was a lot to do with uh, experimenting on uh, rats and rabbits. Uh, and, um, you know, I, uh, I, I just really didn't like it. And also I felt there was a lot of, um, I don't know what you call it, um, fakery going on, it was just, it was all to do with getting papers published in medical journals and uh, some of the research, so-called research we did, I thought was a bit dodgy, but uh, anyway. Uh, so uh, because of my um, sort of lack of enthusiasm for it, uh, I don't think the boss, Priscilla, liked me very much. So then I decided I wanted to do clinical work so then I went to, uh, I, got, I got a job in Brisbane at Princess Alexandra Hospital uh, in the renal unit as registrar in the renal unit. Uh, so she, she thought putting a thousand miles between me and her was a good idea. So she gave me a glowing uh, reference and I got the job. So I moved to Brisbane, uh, I was about uh, 29. So it was the first time really living outside of Melbourne. And uh, my first weekend on, on, uh, at work at the Princess Alexandra, uh, there'd, there'd been, it was a Monday, the, the, the weekend before there were two, there'd been two transplants, renal transplants. And uh, there was this, and there was these two guys. One, one was uh, well-known, I mean, I found out later he was well-known, I'd never heard of him, John, John Mulvick. He was, uh, uh, he was a, uh, a painter. Um, and so to go into the renal unit to look up, you had to really scrub up. And, you, and when you went in there, um, you, you really didn't want to come out in a hurry because it was such a hassle to scrub and put on these sterile clothes and take them off. And so I was in there and um, there was a very attractive young nurse on duty. Uh, so that was another incentive to stay in there longer. So I started hanging out with her and, um, you know, I was this kind of, Hot shot from Melbourne, up up in the up, up, up in the deep north with the banana benders, and uh, um, so I was I remember I was sitting on the desk uh, with my feet up and leaning back, and then the chair fell over backwards, which was extremely embarrassing. But uh, I like to think it was endearing. And uh, a month later, we were living together, and um, uh, uh, so so, so then that I, I saw that year out. And um, another seminal moment in 69, I guess you'd say, was when I started smoking dope, where one, one, of, my, um, one of my friends uh, introduced me to the weed and uh, I kind of liked it, and, uh, uh, but it was illegal and um, you were kind of at risk of losing your medical license getting deregistered I, I think if you were busted and um and I wasn't sure about it so because I was working uh, in this research unit I got the medical librarian to give me all the to reprint reprints on marijuana studies that had been done up to that point and she gave me a stack of uh, reprints like this you know and I started going through these things and I, I couldn't really see that there was anything wrong with it and it, it seemed um kind of a little weird to me that there was such a fuss about marijuana, you know? And um, uh, anyway, I, um, I, got this, uh, I got this job in Brisbane and uh, I drove, drove up uh, from Melbourne in my little Ford Cortina GT500 that I'd bought from uh, one of the doctors in, uh, 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 at the at the repat, uh, you know, I was smoking joints and dropping speed, and I 
uh, I went all the way through and um, uh, just the journey of enlightenment. <laughs> well, it was it was an important part of it, as a matter of fact, you know. <clears throat> it was your Bo no Bodhi tree, but so far it's yeah, been yeah. very interesting. Yeah, that came later. <laughs> yeah. So, I, and I remember I was pretty new in the hospital, and I didn't really know anybody, and except this girl, and um, I was walking with one of the uh, young doctors at the hospital. You know, we were all young, I guess. And he was a little kind of dishevelled. And he, and in those days, you you could smoke in the wards and everything. And and I was walking down a corridor with him, and he pulls out his Stuyvesant and says, "Do you smoke?" And I looked at him and said, "Not those." And he looked at me, and there was we understood immediately. You know, so through him, I got in, introduced into this Brisbane scene with architects, students. I don't know if you know William Young, Willie Young, William Young, the photographer in um, Sydney and uh, Willie Young, he, he was an um, architect student and uh, now he's a photographer and a guy called Ralph Tyrrell was a musician. Um, anyway, there was a whole s scene of Brisbane people that I, that I met through this guy, Tony, and we became good friends, uh, my, my girlfriend Marie and I with he, Tony and his wife, Jill. And, um, uh, and then we had some other friends who in, from who'd come up from Melbourne. You know, in those days, a lot of people had moved up from Melbourne and Sydney to Queensland to sort of back to the land and to um, uh, grow dope and just to live in warm weather. I don't know. So um, we had these other friends who had a little farm in uh, Malulaba, about an hour and a bit north of Brisbane, and um, we used to go up there on weekends and hang with them and then. That was really nice to get out of Brisbane and hang up there on the sort of in from the um, Sunshine Coast. And so these friends of ours, um, the doctor and his wife, and uh, we bought some land, beautiful piece of land, 240 acres at Mullaney. I mean, nobody knew Mullaney back then, but uh, now it's kind of the happening place, right? So. Um, so this was an old uh, cattle farm and it was 240 acres, about 80 of it had been cleared and then we used to go up and hang out there and it was, uh, it was really nice. And at work, um, you know, most of the, at the renal unit, most of the, um, a lot of the patients that we were seeing uh, were there because of their um, dependence on analgesics. Um, you know, they were powders and tablets back then that were, uh, you know, Beck's and Vincent's, I don't know, do they still exist? It was aspirin, phenacid and caffeine. And people got habituated to these. Yeah. Uh, and, and because the caffeine kind of gave them people a bit of a lift. And then when you stop taking them, you get a headache. So you take some more. And a lot of people, especially up north, wiped out their yeah. kidneys because um, these, these new things new were... Sorry. Same as Nurofen. It it's a cyclic thing, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know yeah, what's, same. what's available now, but mm. this stuff was not only available over the counter, but it was yeah. you know, heavily advertised on the radio and TV with jingles and everything. And, you know, the first sign of a headache, take two of these. And um, people were wiping out their kidneys. They're going on dialysis and needing kidney transplants. And it just seemed insane to me that, uh, um, that, there, there, that there was this situation that... Um, these toxic substances were so widely and freely available. And then when I reflected on my short medical career as it was, um, most of the work in hospitals, that I thought probably more than 50% of the patients you'd see in hospitals were there because of tobacco and alcohol, which were also um, you know, heavily advertised and freely available and yada, yada. And it, it seemed like, the state of medical practice was kind of insane that, uh, you know, patients uh, um, would come sort of reeling into the surgery from the ring of life uh, because of the ill effects of tobacco, alcohol, and these uh, analgesics. And then all we did was patch them up and then throw them back out into the situation that made them sick in the first place. So there was that slight getting slight disillusion with, with medicine because you know I, I thought well if as a doctor you know if i really want to benefit 
people, I should stop the advertising, at least stop the advertising of these things. But then when you see what the politics that's involved, you, you realize that, well, if you really want to make a difference, you've got to go get out of medicine and go into politics, which was really a distasteful option. So, um, so it was like that. At the same time, um, this friend of mine, Charlie Vodica, came up from Melbourne, and a lot of people would come up through Melbourne, and we'd, um, you know, as I mentioned, I was living with this, my girlfriend, after about a month, we rented a big house in Cooparoo, uh, Brisbane suburb, which was about a mile from Prince, Princess Alexandra Hospital. We had a lot of bedrooms, and a lot of friends would come up and going up north, or just come up to Brisbane, and they'd, they'd stay with us. This guy, Charlie, uh, had a couple of shops. He used to run Tivoli Market, where the old Tivoli Theatre was. I might know what's there now. Uh, but there was like a sort of a flea market, a sort of alternative uh, hippie sort of market in, in there. And he had a shop in the new Southern Cross Hotel. Uh, not so new now, I think it's gone, isn't it? Yeah, and so. uh, it's where the Beatles stayed in 64. Um, uh, I went to see them at Festival Hall. And uh, uh, he came up, he wanted to open a shop in Brisbane. So he asked me, do you want to go into partnership with me? You know, I'll do all the buying for my stores in Melbourne and for the shop, you, you just have to manage the shop. So I was like, oh, okay, sounds like fun. You know, I might as well do that. So, um, uh, uh, so we, got, we, we opened the shop, it was called Peace in the Sink, which was, uh, in, we, were, we were into Lenny Bruce and, and there was a, a bit that he used to do called, did you have piss in the sink? Uh, and we wanted to call it that, but the people in the other shops in the arcade didn't want, didn't like, that name so we called it peace in the sink and uh i love it um yeah and then i i don't know if you know lenny bruce there was the, the dracula bit where um he does dracula uh and at one point he says come on children drink your blood and bite mama good night and then someone comes to the door and he says what do you want uh, uh now cool it split so then I, we started a wholesale company called Cool It Split. Um, Very good. <laughs> yeah. So you have to go back and do your Lenny Bruce research. I might have to. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and we started this wholesale company because there was this huge craze on Indian bangles, like these five cent bangles. I mean, we bought them for one cent, sold them for five. And then I got a contract to supply Woolworths. I mean, as well. I'd left Princess Alexandra Hospital, by the way, after a year. Then I was working for, in the chest clinic, uh, another sort of nine to five government job, uh, looking at x-rays of people who'd had TB. I you know, see three or four patients a day. It was like so slack. Uh, but the office was not far from the shop. And then when Marie graduated from nursing school at, at Princess Alexandra at the end of uh, uh, 1970, then she started working in the shop. And so I used to go down at lunchtime and hang out. As another, at, at a certain point, the drug squad thought the shop, which was kind of a head shop, was a front for smuggling drugs. So they tried to set us up. And I wish I had time to tell you this story, but it would take half an hour. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we were raided, uh, our house. And, but due to a series of fortunate events, I kind of figured out what was happening. So we cleaned the house out, uh, you know, pulled all the cushions off the couch, vacuumed everything. So when they came, uh, you know, two cops in the back, two cops in the front, they found nothing. They were extremely disappointed because they sent someone to, uh, who, who told them that, you know, there was a lot of stuff there, um, which there wasn't, but there was some. So, um, so that was a little disconcerting. So then I wrote, um, a letter to the medical journal uh, saying, did I send you that? I, I, I could. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, uh, I wrote medical, I didn't expect them to publish it, but they did. And I was saying that how ridiculous the laws against marijuana were and how, you know, tobacco and alcohol and these analgesics were clearly far more toxic than marijuana, yet one is illegal, you can go to lose your license and go to jail, where the other things are freely available advertised killing people. I mean, it was like, you know, it was, so there was this juxtaposition of these two kind of streams. So I thought, screw it, let, let's, 
take a break for a while. So we decided to leave Australia and travel the world for four years. We had this big plan. And then come back and live at Mullaney on the, on the farm. Um, so in May, um, what's today? May the 8th is the 50th anniversary of my leaving Australia. Wow, okay. On this trip that I'm still on. Uh, uh, never went back to, to live. And um, so we, you know, flew to Bali as one does and mm -hmm. uh, uh, hung out on the beach at Kuta for a couple of months and uh, just, uh, um, you know, lying on the beach, doing a bit of body surfing, eating coconuts uh, and smoking dope and just uh, chilling. Living the life. Living the life. It was, and, you know, Kuta, I mean, I haven't been there since, but uh, uh, I believe it's like, you know, from what you hear, it's quite uh, very different now. But even then, people, this is 72, right? So people say, oh, and there was nobody on the beach and there was this, it was like, so paradisical and um there are guys saying oh man it's ruined you should have been here in 67 you know? <laughs> <laughs> go back to 20 go up there there now in 2022 it'd be a very different story again yeah so anyway so uh after two months so our plan was to travel around the pacific rim and then fly to vancouver and get a train to toronto across canada and three of my medical student and doctor friends were doing graduate work in Toronto. Uh, one was doing thoracic surgery, the other two were doing psychiatry. And I was going to go and visit them and then we were going to travel down through the States and Central America and South America, get a boat across to uh, Cape Town and travel up through Africa and through the Middle East, finish up in London after two years, do some work in London, you know, doctoring and nursing and then gradually travel back through, you know, Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, back to Australia four years later. Mm -hmm. That was the plan. So, but on, in Bali, we started meeting all these freaks from America and Europe who'd come down the hippie trail and uh, they were running out of money. And so they go to Bali and then they go to Australia and, and then you could do it. They work for six months, they work for 12 months, save up the money to go back. So we were regaled with tales of, you know, Afghanistan and Pakistan and India and Nepal and hashish and uh, ganja and bang and all, all this legal stuff. And uh, so it sounded much more interesting to stay in the East rather than go back to the West. So we completely ditched our plan and uh, uh, decided to stay in the East. So, you know, even Paradise gets boring after two months. So we left Bali and then we traveled through Java and um, uh, Sumatra. So in Java, we stopped at uh, Jogjakarta and there's this huge temple uh, stupa at Borobudur. I, mean, I didn't really know what, anything about Buddhism then, but um, uh, we, we went to the Borobudur. It hadn't been restored then, but um, I believe the Whitlam government gave quite a bit of money to help uh, restore it. Um, but anyway, we climbed all the way at the top, smoked a joint at the top, uh, went back, traveled uh, through the rest of Java, up through Sumatra. Then we went, went to Lake Toba and hung out there on the island in the middle for about a week. And then, uh, then we uh, went across to Penang and hitchhiked through northern uh, Malaysia into Thailand. Then we got to Thailand and there are all these, these monks and temples and... Uh, I mean, there's all this external manifestations of Buddhism. So we traveled up through Thailand to Bangkok and, um, am I taking too long? Um, no. <laughs> well, it's a fascinating story. We, we do have to get through it. I've been through. <laughs> well, okay, I'll, I'll uh, keep going. I'm, executive This summary. just needs to be a little feature film of like travel, you know, <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I, people will sit okay. in the role. We just need to put it up on YouTube and go with it. I'm loving okay. it. So, um, so we got to Bangkok and um, I decided as a dutiful tourist, I should find out more about this country that I was traveling in. So I went to a bookstore and uh, at that time we were traveling on a pretty tight budget. We were, we were limiting ourselves to a dollar, a dollar a day for food, travel um, and accommodation. 
So I brought some books with me from Australia, which I swapped with other people. And, you know, as you did, people swap books on the, thing, uh, on, the, on, the on the road. Yeah. But nobody had a Buddhist book. So I decided to um, uh, steal one from a bookstore. So I got uh, Marie to distract the bookshop guy. And I, I had these rubber bands under my jeans, around my thigh. So I, I, I stole a book on Buddhism. Yeah. And uh, actually, we were going to India. So I also stole a book on Hinduism and another one on Islam. They were kind of penguin books, um, the mm -hmm. little paperbacks, you know. Uh, quite easy to to uh, hide so that was my beginning of my career in buddhism stealing my first buddhist book i mean it's all coming back to bite me now so uh so um we hung out in bangkok a, a bit and there were some some people we met in bali we hung out with but then we hitchhiked up through uh, we decided to go to laos um I don't remember how we made those decisions, but you know, you talk to people and they say, oh, you should go here, you should go there. This is great, this is amazing, blah, blah, blah. So we we hitched um, up to uh, uh, the Mekong and we crossed on a ferry uh, to Vientiane. And in Vientiane, there was this kind of uh, uh, sort of hippie hovel where you could stay for almost nothing. And so we went to the market and bought a sheaf of dope for about 10 cents and took it back to the hippie hovel. And I rolled up a big joint, started reading this book on Buddhism. And, and that's where I had my second religious experience. Because <laughs> found, huh? found the missing um, Pajan Lama. Well, you know, the, I, this was a book called Buddhism by a guy called Christmas Humphreys. He was a high court judge in England. And he started the Buddhist Society in London. And um, um he'd written some books on zen and uh, and this general book on buddhism and reading this book on buddhism it was like i felt this kind of stirring in my heart a sort of a familiarity and and a feeling that this this stuff seems true it, you know not in the sense of true like an anatomy textbook uh, is true although you know one of my friends found 300 mistakes in gray's anatomy um uh, so it's you know Maybe it's more correct now than it was then. But, uh, but no, this was kind of true in, in a deeper sense. So the guy was talking about meditation. Oh, in Buddhism, meditation is really important. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that was, but sort of made a mental note to find out. So then we went, so then we went from um, Vientiane to the old capital at, at uh, Luang Prabang. Uh, and you know, there was a war going on in 72. There were Pathet Lao all over the place. So you weren't allowed to go overland. You had to fly, which is kind of opposite to how it is now. You know, when there's terrorists around, you don't, you go overland, you don't fly. <laughs> but anyway, we flew to there. We stayed there for uh, about a week. This French guy uh, we'd met on the road. His cousin was a French uh, consul in there. So we stayed in his house. He was in France for the summer. And then we flew to Bang Sai up in the north then back across the Mekong um and we went to chiang mai and then back to, Kat to bangkok and there was this danish guy lars who we'd hung out with for quite a bit in in bali and uh, traveled with him a little bit in java uh before we separated and then um uh, uh so we caught up with him in uh in bangkok and he was out of money and he wanted to go take a, a false bottom suitcase of dope back to copenhagen and uh, he wanted me to stake his trip, like to buy his ticket. Um, and uh, I had a credit card. Um, and uh, uh, it was in days before Visa and Mastercard, it was Diners Club. Um, uh, and the, uh, he would fly this thing back and then he would go back to Kat and we'd rendezvous back in Kathmandu and he'd pay me back with interest. So I thought, ah, oh, this is cool. You know, do a little business on the road instead of just spending money, maybe make a little. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? So, um, so I said, okay. So I bought him his ticket and then we had a destination. We had to be in Kathmandu in a couple of months time to meet him. So, uh, so then we traveled to Burma, spent a week in Burma, very Buddhist country, very, you know, beautiful place, you know. And then we went to Calcutta, 
and um, uh, spent a week. And then I went, uh, I, so I've been reading this book on Buddhism and then we went in Calcutta, we went to a Buddhist organization, the Mahabodhi Society, and I got some more books on Buddhism. And then, uh, uh, you know, we spent a few days in Calcutta and then uh, we, we went, took the train to the Nepalese border and got the bus to Kathmandu. When we got to Kathmandu, um, uh, as we got off the bus at the bus station, there was this Brazilian guy, Jose, uh, that we'd also known in Bali and Bangkok. And he greeted us, you know, and said, what are you doing here? I said, oh, we have to meet Lars. Have you seen him? He said, no, I haven't seen him. So then he took us to his hotel and he showed us around town and you know, where to listen to music, where to get the best curd, where you get pie, all the important things and where you buy dope, you know on Freak Street, of course, and um, uh, and then he sort of tossed off, oh, and if you're interested in Buddhist meditation, there's a meditation course starting at this monastery next week. Oh, Buddhist meditation. That's what I wanted to find out about. So we went up there and found out, indeed, this uh, one-month course was starting uh, the, the next week, and it was like 300 rupees to do, which was about a dollar a day and uh, food, accommodation, tuition, the whole thing. Much cheaper to stay there than Kathmandu. We had to wait for Lars, so why not? So we did this course. And there's the, the story. The rest <laughs> is history, baby. I, oh, mean, I love it. That was your boating trip. <laughs> even halfway through, <laughs> we were thinking, we were planning to go to Goa for the winter, like everybody did, you know. And But by the end of the course, you know, no way I could leave. Mm. And most people left, but, uh, uh, and Marie, well, she felt the same, you know, um, she was kind of uh, into it. So we decided to stay and help these teachers, Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa Rinpoche. And uh, it was a one month course and it was, uh, you know, introduction to Tibetan Buddhism and it was just, uh, you know, amazing stuff. And uh, uh, and we had a textbook there that had been compiled by students from the previous course. This was the third course that they'd given for Westerners on uh, the path to enlightenment, Tibetan path to enlightenment, Buddhist path to enlightenment. And um, so this was, um, uh, so the course I was, that we were at was the third course. And this book had notes, really there were notes from students from the previous course. So afterwards, the, the course was mainly taught by Lama Zopa Rinpoche, uh, who's, and he taught in English, and Lama Yeshi, who was kind of the head Lama, he, he, they both spoke English, they both taught in English, which was very unusual for Tibetan uh, Lamas yeah. at that time. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it was, there were very few interpreters around too. There weren't that, certainly very few Westerners could uh, translate, and, um, and not too many Tibetan monks knew English enough to translate. So they attracted quite a big following over the years of, of Westerners. But at, at the end of the course, I, I went to Lama Zopa and I said, you know, this is a really life-changing book. It was, uh, it was just cyclist style. I think it wasn't printed, published properly or anything. Uh, he said, oh, well, that was put together by the students at the previous course. Uh, you know, I have an idea how, I, how I'd like to uh, rework it. So if you'd like to, uh, work with me on it we, we could we could do that and I was like yeah sure mm -hmm. so then for the next for six weeks so there was another course coming up in March this was uh, November and uh, 72 and uh, next the fourth course was in March 73 so um, so we spent six weeks going through this thing rewriting the whole from beginning to end and um, so you know he would I would write down what he said, and then Marie would type it all up. I, I couldn't type them. And, um, uh, and then I would edit it, and then she would retype it. And then we printed that for the next course. In the meantime, you know, I'd been, uh, you know, we'd been on the road, sent a postcard here, a postcard from there, back to my mother, and different friends, you know. Then, then there was, you know, radio silence for a month. Then, this Buddhist evangelist appears after four weeks of indoctrination. And all of a sudden, my mother gets like a 14 page letter explaining how, you know, their reincarnation, there are past and future lives, and 
uh, you know, hell, and uh, you can get reborn as an animal. And, uh, you know, the only thing to do is to follow this path and uh, work for the enlightenment of all sentient beings. She thought I'd gone troppo. Then a week later, there's a 20 page letter, same stuff, except more. Uh, I, I, I think she was seriously worried. At the same time, I wrote to all these different friends of mine saying, you've got to come here. These lamas are amazing. This is this, this Buddhist trip is, you, you can't even believe how amazing it is, you know? So, you know, so a lot of friends decided, well, let's go to Kathmandu, the dope's legal. Um, it's a good excuse to go. And, uh, and a lot of them were kind of loose end and then not everybody I wrote to went, but they showed the letters to their friends. So at the next course, there were about 20, 25 people from Australia who'd either uh, got these letters or seen these letters and, and um, including my mother. And, and she came to rescue me from the cult. But uh, in fact, um, uh, you know, by the, at the end of the, that next course, the fourth course, uh, she wasn't convinced, but then she went back and looked into it further. And then she kind of got into Buddhism. She became, she got it hooked up with the Buddhist Society of Victoria, which was in Richmond at the time. And she became their treasurer for like 14 years. And, um, and then uh, the students um, who'd been to these courses um, started inviting the Lamas to go to the West. So in 74, uh, they went, came to America and Australia, and there was a big one-month meditation course, very similar to the ones they were running in, Copa, in Nepal, uh, in Diamond Valley, near, and it was organised by my friends, Tom and Kathy, uh, who we first used to go and visit, who gave us the idea to get land, um, who lived in Malulaba. This Diamond Valley was just down from their farm. So after the course, the students wanted to start a Buddhist centre, and we had this land. Uh, at, um, so just before we left Australia, um, we had this land at Mulaney that we were planning to go back to, but with Tom and Kathy, we bought another piece of land at Udlo. And, uh, and this was kind of an investment just, and halfway through our trip, when we were in London, we imagined we might be running out of money. So we were gonna sell our part of the land and um, get money to continue traveling for another two years. So we had this land and, um, and Tom and Kathy came to well, among the Australians who came to this uh, fourth course, and they kind of got uh, into the lamas and into, into the Tibetan Buddhist trip, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and they were instrumental in inviting the lamas to come and give this course. So after the course, they showed the lamas this land at Yudlo, which was just a sort of walk up the hill from where the diamond from Diamond Valley. And. Uh, uh, and they decided to make that into this land, 160, 170 acres into a Buddhist center, which was um, uh, the first Tibetan Buddhist center in Australia. It's called Chenrezig Institute. I don't know, is it well known or not? I don't know. Um, I've heard of it and I'm not sure. I, I haven't spent a lot of time up in the North. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's probably one of the larger Buddhist centers, certainly the most well-established. Um, uh, so um, uh, so that that um, that happened, and then um, over the subsequent years, the lamas kept uh, being invited from different students in different countries, and uh, they were they were traveling, giving courses, and centers started. Sort of, there wasn't a plan to do this; it just happened very organically. And uh, um, for me personally, I, I kind of. Um, after about a year, I decided I wanted to become a monk and Marie decided she wanted to become a nun. And uh, we, so there were about another eight uh, Westerners who decided similarly. So in January 74, we went to Bodh Gaya, the place of Buddha's enlightenment in uh, India. And um, uh, um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was giving a Kala Chakra initiation. And, uh, you know, there are 100, 120,000 Tibetans there. It was an amazing scene. And, um, uh, and then we got ordained. His Holiness uh, did the first part of the ceremony. And then his senior tutor, His Holiness Ling Rinpoche, uh, gave us the actual ordination as monks and nuns. So um, 
and about 10 of us got ordained at that time. And, um, uh, and then I went back to Copan, we all did, and then we started a little Western monastic community at this Tibetan monastery. So we were, there was an old building uh, in, on part of the property. So the Lama Yeshi gave us that as our um, uh, place. And so we started uh, doing our monastic thing there, you know, doing um, prayers and different practices in the morning and evening and uh, working on the teachings and then uh, doing different, different, you know, we all had different jobs, uh, cooking and um, uh, teaching English to the young monks. And then I started a medical clinic. Actually, I started the year before when all these people were coming from Australia to the course. I got them all to bring um, medicines and uh, different stuff. And we started a little medical clinic at the monastery to serve um, the monks and to serve the local Nepali people mm -hmm. and also the Westerners who were um, who, who were coming to these courses. There were about 50 people at the first course that I went to in 72. The next one where my friends and people came, there were about 120 people. Uh, and then the next one, the fifth one, which was in the fall uh, of 73, uh, there were about 200 people. And then the sixth one, there were 250 people. Uh, that was too many, and a lot of people left because it was so difficult conditions. And um, and then the sort of evened out. They did these courses every year, and they're still going. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been 52 or 53 now, and they usually get a couple of hundred people at each one. Uh, the last couple of years, I don't know if there's one this year with the COVID, but they haven't had it for the last couple of years. Um, but then, um, uh, so I got into... Uh, I edited this uh, textbook for Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and then um, we started recording the Lama's teachings and uh, editing them into sort of um, commentaries, uh, uh, commentaries to these um, to, to this textbook. And uh, in '75, the Lamas did an extensive world trip, and I got um, asked to be their the roadie. So I travelled with them for nearly nine months. Uh, so I was um, doing all the arrangements with the tickets and organize, working with people who were organizing courses and I was leading meditations and discussion groups. Um, and we traveled, we went to uh, Thailand, we did a weekend seminar and, um, uh, and then we went to Australia and um, the Lama Yeshi gave a five day meditation course in Dramana and uh, then I gave a 10 day meditation course in Sydney. And then the Lamas gave a one month meditation course at Chen Rezi Institute. And by that stage, a year later, they'd built this temple, um, which, uh, which the first course was there in 75. Then they went to New Zealand. There was a two or three week course in Wellington. And then we went to California. Um, There's a three week course there, then another one in Indiana, and then a weekend seminar in London. And then a two-week course in Switzerland, a two-week course in Italy, and then back to India, and then back to the monastery in Nepal uh, for the um, eighth meditation course, the end of '75. And at the end of that course, um, there was an American guy, Jesse, came to see Lama Yeshi. He had a small publishing company in Hawaii, and he had a proposal to publish the teachings that Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa Rinpoche had given in the States in '74 on their first trip to the West. So because I was kind of running publishing there in, at, um, uh, at Copan, uh, um, Lama Yeshi called me over and said, look, this guy wants to publish our teachings, you know, make some kind of deal with him, don't give anything away, we keep the copyright, um, and we'll call our publishing company Publications for Wisdom Culture. So, um, so we, we made this deal, and then he published this book, it was called Wisdom Energy, uh, I should have bought this to show you, but anyway, they're around. Um, uh, so that, that was the beginning of a company that's now called Wisdom Publications. Um, all those books you can see on those shelves are published by Wisdom uh, in since um, 76. Okay. Um, 
And this, actually, that's all the wisdom books. There are, there are a lot more on another shelf. Um, so, um, so I was running that. And then uh, in 77, 76, Lama Yeshi said, we needed a center in Delhi. So uh, he sent me to Delhi to start this meditation center, which was different from the others. You know, the others were started by students in the countries like Australia, can we start a center, okay. Um, but in Delhi, we didn't have any students and, uh, but Lama Yeshi thought that, um, uh, you know, Buddhism had all but died out in India. Uh, and, uh, but the Indian people had been very kind to the Tibetans in providing Buddhism in the first place. And, and then, uh, and Tibet and Buddhism flourished in Tibet for a thousand years until 59. And then with the Chinese invasion, so many Dalai Lama and so many other Tibetans fled Tibet to India, and then the Indians took them in and gave them refuge. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but because uh, uh, Buddhism had been so weakened over that millennium in India, Lama Yeshi said we should try to help reintroduce Buddhism to Indian people, and that's why we want a center in Delhi. Okay, so I went down there, and uh, you know, after a couple of years' effort, we finally got something going. And then I ran that for, uh, did that for six years and I started actually a small publishing company, Mahayana Publications, we published some stuff in Delhi. And at that's then wisdom, in the meantime, wisdom publications had moved to England. And then uh, in 83, the guy was running it quit. And so Len Lama Yeshi sent me to London to take over wisdom publications. So then I left Delhi um, and uh, then I took over Wisdom Publications uh, in London, and um, I found it very difficult in London to, to live as a monk, you know, it was not the most monastic of environments, and also I thought as I'm trying to run this business in London, so I stopped wearing my robes, I started wearing lay clothes, and just, you know, I had a weak, weak mind, and uh, powerful environment. So after three years, human. I- Human, just human. Yeah, well, I was uh, too human, human for, my, for my own good. So- We can only uh, remain, you know, we anyways, can only remain in that spiritual time for a certain- Yeah, know, it's just like, I, I decided I'd rather be a good layman than a bad monk. So um, yeah, uh, I don't know exactly. how good a layman I've been, but um, yeah. so then, uh, uh, so, yeah, so then we ran Wisdom and then, and, and the company quite grew quite well, but um, the main market was in the States. So we decided to, to move to Boston in uh, 89. So then I brought the company to Boston and um, uh, uh, I worked there for seven years. Um, and then uh, we decided that the teachings of our own teachers were sort of being neglected because um, they re required a lot of work. And uh, from a business point of view, it was very hard to invest the money in editing those teachings. It would take like a year to make a book and you could never earn the money back by selling it. Uh, and in the meantime, these other authors uh, were presenting us with complete manuscripts. So all the Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa Rinpoche's teachings which were really the foundation of this whole organization uh, that they created. Um, we we're always getting pushed to the back burner. So in 96, we decided to form a separate uh, entity uh, called Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive, which would focus on the teachings of Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa. And by that stage, they had plenty of students all over the world uh, willing to support it. So, uh, I left Wisdom in 96 and then since then I've been running this archive of the, of the Lama's teachings. So, you know, we've preserved all their teachings and Lama's open is still teaching all over the world. Well, not the last couple of years, but um, uh, there's just so much material being created all the time. So we try to archive it and then publish uh, what we can either as uh, print books or as eBooks or on our website, lamayeshi.com, 
um, uh, we we do stuff on uh, on YouTube. We have a lot of videos at the, uh, on our YouTube channel, and um, and we do a podcast every month. So, you know, the technology allows you to do, as you know, so much these days. Yeah, it's just all the tech stuff in, involved with doing it. Um, so that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Well, that sounds like a good. Well, it is. Doesn't sound like it is a good story. Uh, and it's very real, and, and that's what we're all about, is, is sharing people's stories. Um, because in the last almost hour we've been talking, you've condensed a whole lifetime of information <laughs> into and very colourfully, you know, which, um, which I think <coughs> it's good to see you haven't lost your Australianisms in all of this too. You know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to hear you talk. You're very, you know, you have that monthly gentleness that I'm monthly. used to. Monthly. Sorry, Shirley. Monthly. Monthly. Yes. Monthly. Well, yeah. you know, it's one of the things I found when I was um, when I was living in India and, and working there with monks. They all speak very much in that gentle, easy, relaxed sort of way when they're conversing, uh, which I really can see in what you're doing and uh, it's it's pretty amazing wow in the i guess in the the scheme of what we're doing um buddha's birthday is a very important time uh, what's that experience been like for you in the past well you know it's just it's just part of the whole thing really uh, there are four um special buddhist days uh in, in the annual calendar that the Tibetan Buddhists or the Buddhists celebrate. But th this, this Vesak or um, Buddha's birthday celebrates uh, his birth, his enlightenment and his passing away. Um, I think in some certain traditions um, in like Theravada tradition, like in Thailand or uh, Burma, you know, or Sri Lanka, um, they celebrate it, uh, I think, in the lunar calendar, the full moon of the third month, and the Tibetans, it's the full moon of the fourth month. I, I don't know why there's that difference. But um, uh, uh, you know, at the Buddha centers, they have uh, all day ceremonies and, uh, and meditation and teachings and um, uh, people take 24-hour commitments to avoid certain negative actions, um, which you were supposed to avoid any time, all the time, but uh, you make a special effort that day, you know. Um, uh, and, um, you know, there are certain, you know what a puja is, uh, sort of a chanting ceremony. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there, there are special ones that are, do that, that are done on that day. Mm. Um, that celebrate the life of the Buddha, and um, uh, and there are twelve there are twelve famous deeds, uh, such as his being um, born and then his leaving his palace, uh, you know, becoming a renunciate, and um, you know, meditating for six years under the Bodhi tree, mm -hmm. and attaining enlightenment, and giving his first teaching, um, and. Uh, um, uh, a bunch of other ones that I don't even remember, and then his uh, passing away. So 12, 12 deeds um, that are also mentioned in these uh, ceremonies on, the, on that day. Um, so it's kind of like a Thanksgiving, really, just remembering, um, the, you know, those of us who are Buddhists, you know, remembering the kindness of, of the Buddha who went underwent uh, many hardships uh, uh, to attain enlightenment, uh, not just in, the, in that one life that we, re we see on this earth, but in hundreds of previous lives that are told in a, a text called the Jataka Tales or the, the Buddha's previous life birth stories. Mm -hmm. I think there are like 550 uh, life stories from his previous lives as a, a bodhisattva on the path to enlightenment. Um, you know, so all, all, all that kind of is... Uh, the focus of, of that particular time. Uh, actually, it's uh, there's the full moon day is the big day, but there's actually 
uh, two weeks leading up to it that, that, are, special, that are special days. Yep. Shirley, you wanted to jump in? I think around the, yeah, I do. Um, I think around the planet it's become, whether you follow the Buddhist teachings or not, a, anybody that sort of hears about it inspires them to come together wherever they are and honour the fact that, you know, there's a, of that higher energy or, or you know, get into their spiritual self and sometimes they need something like that to be able to connect into and also you know realize that they are so close to the earth with us on these days so people make a point themselves to connect to the earth to the higher wisdoms and the teaching and 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 whatever they can grasp in that moment it's become like a bit of a you know we talked about the harmonic convergence it's a little bit of a harmonic for those that are really you know, uneducated in it all, but they seem to, oh, a lot of people, you'd be surprised, um, find a resonance with it around the world. I've, I've found over the years, people here, oh, we sat back and they don't have to have something in them as able to connect. Yeah, I think it's and also, other, sorry. And the other, and I had a question, when you mentioned the 500 plus lives, where did the information from those come from? Of his of the past ring. Oh, I think Buddha Buddha himself told those stories to his disciples back at the time, and uh, Ananda, who was one of his main disciples, had had this like uh, photographic memory. Uh, after the after the Buddha passed away, uh, the monks all gathered round, and Ananda, who was with the Buddha all, all the time, uh, remembered all the teachings that he gave, and he could recite them all, and uh, they were they were written down. Oh. And um, uh, there are a number of uh, councils and, uh, and you know, maybe, uh, I don't know how many um, arhats or liberated beings, you know, who'd freed themselves from ignorance and karma uh, were, were there at the time, but they had this big convocation and, and maybe they all kind of contributed different uh, memories and different stories that became the foundation of the Pali Canon, the early canon of the Buddhist, Buddhist teachings, um, you know, much of which has been um, translated. There are um, wisdom publications from that second top shelf. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, large volumes of translations by Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is one of the main translators of the Pali Canon an American monk, um, published by Wisdom. Actually, we published the first one in London and the others have been published here in Boston. So in, in understanding that, uh, and I listened to a bit of a talk on that you did on reincarnation and enlightenment and the various dimensions, I, I, I think is the right word, that you can exist in. Um, how, how did that... Does that sort of work with what, in I guess, in life for people to understand that? Because a lot of people struggle with understanding reincarnation. A lot of people struggle with understanding uh, what past lives and future lives are, that sort of thing. So how does that sort of work in with, with your understanding? Well, you know, in my first uh, meditation course, the one I went to in 72, the third course at Copan, um, you know, there was a lot of stuff that, I mean, a lot of stuff that was completely new to me that I, I couldn't relate to. I was pretty skeptical about past and future lives, your reincarnation being one of them, you know, these different realms of existence. Um, you know, Buddhism talks about six different realms, a human realm. Okay, you can see that. Animal realm. Okay, you can see that. But then there are other realms like a spirit realm. Most of us can't see the spirits, but that's... A plane of existence, the Buddha explained, exists. There's what uh, uh, we translate as the hell realms, which is the state of greatest suffering. Uh, again, we can't uh, see that with our current state of perception. And then the higher realms, there are a couple of different levels of celestial or God realms, uh, God with a small g, you know. Um, so do they, do these things exist or don't they exist? That's you know, those are the important questions that uh, uh, we're faced with when we, we come to Buddhist teachings. And um, so, uh, 
you know, the Buddha himself said, look, what I teach is true, but don't believe it just because I said so. And, you know, I can't, you, I can't imagine what it was like to be in his presence, but it must have been incredibly powerful, you know, and, um, and you kind of take what he said as, uh, as gospel. But um, uh, he said, don't accept, even though what I teach is true, don't accept because I said so. Um, you have to examine it for yourself. Um, and he used the analogy of a goldsmith. When you come to a goldsmith with a lump of metal, you think, oh, here, would you like to buy this gold? He's not going to say, okay, here's a thousand bucks. He's going to look at it and examine it, you know, assay it. Uh, the expression they used was rubbing, cutting and melting, which I guess is how they check to see if metal was gold. They'd rub it, they'd cut into it, they'd melt it and see if it was pure or not. So he said, examine my teachings in that way uh, and come to your own conclusion. So doubt was always, um, you know, I went to Scotch College as a Presbyterian school and it was like, you couldn't question anything. It's in the book. It's the Bible, you know, it's the word of God. It is, how dare you, you know? Um, so Buddhism is the opposite. He says, please doubt everything, examine it, but resolve your doubt. You know, doubt is good, but only if you so resolve the doubt. Mm. Same yeah. as what we have to do in, you know, we, in the spiritualist philosophy to discern, to find your own evidence and to journey it yourself and not just take everything everything to you know educate yourself to live it to find what's right for you you know put aside what isn't at that time keep it there for later and right, exactly you know, evidence exactly yeah it's not it's not a religion it's philosophy a way of being and a way of living so it's going to resonate well, just, hopefully yeah. within the heart differently for everyone you know i remember one of the early courses a student who was having trouble with rebirth or reincarnation or mental continuity, whatever you want to call it. Um, he, he said to Lama Zopra, he asked the question, is, he said, is it necessary to believe in reincarnation to become enlightened? And the answer was, it's not a question of belief. It's a question of seeing what exists and what doesn't exist. Um, and then at, at the uh, in the in the teaching hall, there was a, a clay elephant with you know, like a flower pot, mm -hmm. and he pointed at that. I remember this very clearly. This was fall of seventy three. He said, "There's no use me believing that that elephant, that clay pot elephant, doesn't exist. It's there. You can see it. You know, and uh, so." And you know what I understood was that there are basically three ways of deciding whether something is true or not. So the the best way is through your personal experience. Um, so now, in terms of uh, mental continuity, you know, past and future lives, uh, the, the best way to know whether it's true or not is to remember your past lives and to have the clairvoyance to see your future lives. But that's very difficult because, you know, most of our minds are so clouded and so distracted, we can't even focus for, you know, on this one. <laughs> well, uh, no, I'm just saying just to focus your mind for, for mm -hmm. even 30 seconds without it wavering from the object of concentration is very difficult. So, um, you know, we don't even remember what we had for, for breakfast uh, this time last year or, or even last week. I mean, uh, our memory is very unclear. So the only way to, to really um, see past and uh, future lives is through developing perfect concentration. So per developing perfect concentration has to be done on the basis of leading uh, a life of pure morality. Um, so I can't get into all the details, but you know, not killing, not stealing. <laughs> well, not that's, a whole, yeah, that's a whole. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole another topic about karma, mm. you know. But on the basis of pure morality, then to practice uh, meditation, you know, folk, and that means for most of us, it will mean going into retreat for months or years. And, and, and focusing around on a single object, 
uh, on a basis, on the foundation of this life of, uh, of pure morality. So to get that experience of past and future lives is going to take more effort than most of us are prepared to put in, even if we want to, you know, so that's, so that's, but still, that's, uh, um, <clears throat> That's one way. The second way of knowing something is true. One, so like, you know, I mean, I know what it's like in Australia. I'm living in America. And if someone, and, and I can describe the street where I grew up. And if I start telling someone in America, you know, oh, the street where I grew up, it, it was, you know, we lived in this house and it was a red brick house. And, and next door there was a yellow brick house and there was this, uh, tree outside in the, on, on the nature strip and so he said ah oh, come on that's not true that can't be true I know it's true because it's my experience you know I don't care what anybody tells me I was there I remember it you know I know so no matter who tells me there's no such thing as Australia I, you know I'm not going to believe it so so that's one the second way of knowing something is true is through logical deduction so then to understand about past and future lives you have to understand what the mind is you have to stand, and the, uh, you know, the way we're brought up, the, what most people believe <clears throat> is that the mind comes from the brain. It's, the mind is something to do with chemical, electrical, some kind of activity in the brain, you know, and, and that's, that's where the mind comes from. But, uh, the, um, you know, again, long topic, big topic, but from a Buddhist point of view, the mind is defined with two words. They're clear and knowing. Clear means the mind is formless, like empty space. You know, empty, this, this room, I mean, it's not empty space because there's molecules of air and oxygen and everything uh, floating around, you know, but, um, but space is unobstructed. You know, you can move freely through it. So the mind is like empty space in that it's formless. It has no shape or color. Uh, but it's different from space in that it has the second property of cognition, of, of being like a mirror, being able to reflect objects, mm -hmm. of, 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 of awareness, of cognition. So anything that's formless, a formless phenomenon that has this ability is mind. And anything that doesn't have this ability is not mind. So the brain is not mind. The brain has shape and color. It's made of molecules and atoms and, you know, subatomic particles and all this stuff. So um, another axiom is that uh, in, in terms of cause and effect, an effect has to be similar in nature to its principal cause. Like if I plant an apple seed, I'm not going to get oranges. I'm going to get apples. But the seed itself is not enough. The apple seed is the principal cause of an apple tree. But if I put that seed on a table and leave it there, it's not going to grow. It needs support what? from, you know, dirt, water, minerals, sunshine, you know. So all effects or results, I'm going to say all, there may be a few exceptions, have principal and secondary causes. So the principal cause of the apple tree is the seed. The secondary cause or the conditions are the things that nurture the seed. The environment. It's, in, it's yeah, environment exactly. in every aspect. Yeah, so the environment is like a support or for, for these principal causes to exist. Mm -hmm. In terms of the mind, the mind is a formless entity with the ability to perceive objects, if we agree on that definition. So its principal cause cannot be something that doesn't have those properties. It, it can't be a material object like the brain. So the mind can only um, emerge from a previous state of mind. So if we, if we look at our mind, we'll see that there's nothing there really other than the thought that's just finished or the one that hasn't come yet. It's just a series of thought moments like a, we talk about a stream of consciousness, you know, uh, just changing in the shortest fraction of a second not still for a moment. There's not a little chunk of mind. So what can cause that can only be, so like today's mind, my today's mind came from yesterday's mind. And yesterday's mind came from last year's mind. And last year's mind came from the 1950s mind, 1940s mind. And where did that come from? That, that came from the mind that was 
um, came from, it was in my mother's womb. And that mind came from my previous life's mind. When my father's sperm and my mother's egg came together, there was a third factor that joined those products of conception. And that was my previous life's mind. So those three things were necessary to form, uh, you know, a living being's mind or a living being, in fact. So, um, so anyway, so there's much more you can say, but that's the essence of the logical deduction to come to the conclusion that the mind must have come from a previous mind. It can't come from the brain. It can't come from, it doesn't come from the parent's mind. It doesn't come from some kind of cosmic consciousness. It comes from its own, uh, its own continuity. Again, big story. Love it. The third way of knowing something's true is through what we call, you know, scriptural authority. So, um, or, you know, the, uh, so, so the Buddha taught past and future lives because he saw his own past and future lives. And he saw that everybody has past and future lives. And he explained how, to access them. And because the people around him were highly evolved uh, at that time, because if they weren't, they wouldn't have had the karma uh, or the energy to be born at the time of the Buddha himself, you know? Um, so he taught them these techniques and they practiced his techniques and they same, achieved the same realizations, the same understanding that he had. And so that proved that his experience wasn't unique, that it was transmissible and that the people who put in the effort to follow the path that he did would get the same result. And so over the centuries, over the millennia, uh, people who've been practicing this and achieving, even to this day, uh, the same understandings and realizations of the Buddha have proven to themselves that what the Buddha taught was true and then they explain it to others. And because they've done the work and we haven't, we can't say that they're making it up, that they're wrong. The only way we can prove they're wrong is to do the work and show, oh, that doesn't happen at all. That's nonsense. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, there'd be a lot of work to do to come yeah. to a negative conclusion, but um, that's the only, you know, authentic way you can do it. And it's a, it's a, a, a theme that travels through because it's the same as the Jesus or the Christ, whatever you want to call him in that regard. Whatever you... But, you know, it's, he was here to, not just me, you all have these gifts, you all have this ability. You know, you can all heal, you can all do to show us that everything is in all of us. It's, well, what, it's, what, you what, know, it's the same theme of teaching. So the first teaching in this textbook that I mentioned before, uh, and it wasn't a, a book, a textbook that you'd give Tibetan students because they all know the mind is beginningless. But the first mm -hmm. topic in Lama Zopa Rinpoche's book was the mind is beginningless and explains some of these points mm -hmm. that I've been mentioning. The second topic was, but how is it possible to attain enlightenment? And uh, the explanation there was that everybody's mind, everybody's beginningless mind, has a pure, clear, light nature at its very essence, at the very heart of our, of our consciousness, of our mind, is a pure, clear, light nature. But we can't access it now because it's covered uh, with delusions, with ignorance, attachment, greed, pride, envy, jealousy. I mean, so many negative emotions uh, and, and so much negative karma we've created through acting under the influence of these delusions. So- uh, um, Which we're uh, at the end of a cycle of now, so we'd better get a move on and start doing the hard work and bring Exactly, and, and that's what the Buddha did. And that's that what are a he harder to feel instead of those easy ones. Yes. So, and, you know, the analogy given was that the mind is like a pure, clear mirror smeared with filth. So the way oh. to clean the mirror is with soap and water, and the way to purify the mind is through practicing Dharma, you know, through practicing the Buddha's teachings. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental teaching is uh, to... Um, you know, lead a life of, of pure morality, to not, uh, not follow, uh, not create negative actions such as killing, mm. stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, speaking harshly, slandering, gossiping, you know, having, harboring ill will, harboring, 
harboring covetousness, you know, and uh, holding wrong views. So these are sort of 10 uh, sort of typical ne negative actions that we all indulge in, most of us indulge in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So first we have to get control of our mind to stop doing that. And on, as well as that, then we have to do practices that purify our mind because we've been creating these negative actions since beginningless time. And so our mind is very heavily imbued with uh, negative tendencies and, and wrong views and uh, erroneous beliefs. So um, we have to study teachings that explain what's correct. We have to, have to lead a life accordingly and we have to practice meditation to develop concentration. And once we've developed per concentration, we have to study the teachings on ultimate reality or what we call emptiness, uh, you know, the um, absence of inherent existence, <laughs> another huge topic. And, uh, and then understand, um, develop an intellectual understanding of ultimate reality and then through developing um, the intellectual understanding of ultimate reality, then focusing our perfectly concentrated mind on that understanding and sort of um, uh, becoming one with that understanding. You know, they talk about developing three levels of wisdom. There's the wisdom of hearing, where we hear something for the first time we didn't know about, like, you know, the mind is beginning with, oh, I heard about that for the first time. To that extent, I eliminated the ignorance of uh, not knowing that there was such a thing, you know. Oh. So, there, so there's that, the wisdom of hearing, or we hear or read something for the first time. Then the second is the wisdom of contemplation, where, as I mentioned before, you have doubt, maybe, maybe not. So you resolve the doubt, and you come to a clear intellectual understanding or a clear conclusion. And then if you find that conclusion is opposite or different from what you've uh, intuitively always believed, then you have to focus uh, single pointedly on the correct conclusion to sort of burn that into your mind so that the wisdom of meditation displaces the ignorance of uh, misunderstanding. So that's kind of the process. And um, Buddha's teachings were introduced to Tibet in about 650 um, of the, what do you call it, CE, the common era? Yeah. Used to call AD, CE. So, um, uh, and then they, they were introduced and then they re were really introduced 100 years later uh, when a couple of great scholars were invited by the King Trisong Detsen from India. And, um, uh, and then they flourished and then there was an anti-Buddhist king came to power, so he suppressed the Buddhist teachings. Um, and then someone knocked him off. Uh, so then there was this vacuum and all kinds of wrong teachings and uh, false gurus came from India, you know, much like they do these days. And uh, so then, some, then they invited this great teacher, a teacher from Tibet, uh, from India to come to Tibet to straighten Buddhism out. So he came and one of the first things he did, he, he looked at all the 40 years of Buddha's teachings and he arranged them in in a, in a kind of a psychological logical psychologically logical way, which was called the Lam Rim or the stages of the path in uh, Lam Rim in Tibetan, and and that show that was like a roadmap to enlightenment, and you know people talk about miracles, but there's a roadmap that you can look at and see every step you have to take from where you are now to where you want to go enlightenment. You can see every step, hundreds, thousands of them, that you have. To they're topics to be studied, understood, meditated on, and realized. And there are many, uh, there are many books on the Lum Rim or stages of the path now in English, which is, which there weren't 50 years ago when I started. But um, uh, it's just unbelievable, you know, how much stuff there is in English. I mean, this is, it's a little more than scratching the surface, but. Um, Back then, there were like three or four books you could get in English on, on Tibetan Buddhism, and, and now you would, wouldn't even bother with those. Yeah, so, well, that's it. Yeah. So it's just incredible what's happened over 50 years. In, oh, my God, sorry. Get it. No, no, it's okay. We, we're going to have to wrap up uh, this yeah. show. Uh, 
we could sit down and, and just go into so much more detail that we haven't even touched on yet. Uh, and yeah, I know you had a few things you wanted to ask me, but I've, I've dominated the conversation. But, well, this is, this is how it I happens sometimes. No, like it's, it's been, but it's been a story of the journey to get in there. So I think that's fine. Well, I tell you, you know, if, if someone had told me 50 years ago, if you do this meditation course, this is what's going to happen. I wouldn't have gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would have yeah. gone to Goa and smoke dope and listen to rock yeah. and roll. Yeah, well, you know, and that was the thing. But now, now you're out there and you've helped <coughs> countless people. Couldn't even put a figure on how many people to yeah, understand yeah. something that is really important. And and in a way, you know, as I, as we sort of allude, or I alluded to in in our emails, is you know. Buddhism and spiritualism are virtually almost hand in hand because they're trying to teach you to think about what you're doing, the essence of meditating and connection and understanding and finding your truth. They're all right. intermingled together. And, you know, um, the journey that I had in India working with the monks there was just beautiful, especially the older monks with the, the debating and the talking and the discussions and the, exactly. you know, the, the thought processes that go into understanding, you know, everything that happens within life. I mean, this is not a, you know, you might say it's a lifetime journey. However, it's not really. It's thousands of lives and, you know, it's all bringing you to the, that place of awareness. And, and that's, that's how I sort of see the connection between the two. So exactly. uh, Lama Yeshi used to have this little thing he'd say, you know, uh, very shorthand, you know, long way baby. And, <laughs> and, and uh, I'm not sure where it came from. Some people think there was a cigarette ad, a Virginia Slims ad saying, you know, you've come a long way, baby. And you've got this fashionable woman smoking a Virginia Slim. But, uh, but the implication is, as the song goes, uh, you've got a long way to go. Remember, you came a long way from St. Louis, but baby, you got a long way to long go. Way to go. Yep. So Lama would say, long way, baby. And you never knew whether he meant you've come a long way or you've got a long way to go. Oh, <laughs> or both. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, I love it. Very interesting. Very interesting. It is. It is. Um, Nick, look, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to your story. It really has. Um, well, I appreciate you asking me. I just want to really make clear that my mission, such as it is, is to try and introduce people to, to the Lamas, to get them to meet the Lamas. I'm, I'm not a Lama, I'm not a teacher myself, you know, and, and I've tried to make the other part of my mission, uh, you know, to make the teachings available in whatever form I can. Mm. So, you know, in print or online or whatever these days. So uh, I just want to make that clear. Yeah, no, well, that, that, that is very clear. And we will put links up. Uh, so people can sort of get access and I'll talk to you about that. Uh, yeah, and that's why, I hope you can hear me, that's why doing the interview this way and you speaking your journey is important because, Anthony, if we can have this as a YouTube or something, you know, a visual YouTube, that they're, not, they're more likely, instead of just coming, oh, he's, I'll read a book, I'll, I'll do this. This is giving them energy and mm. connection, yeah. a, a soul connection, a human connection, of interest, not just, oh, well, as, boring. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's actually to give. I think it's a really good thing how it's evolved today because it will give that connection. Yes, yeah, speaking of connections and noise. Yeah. All right. Uh, we will uh, talk uh, again soon, Nick, because I'd, I'd like to put a couple of other questions to you, and and oh. so we're going to do a story in the in the May issue uh, oh. about your journey and how we, how we can get people to understand that, you know, uh, as Shirley put it earlier, you don't have to be perfect to live a life um, and understand where we're going with things. So um, so on that note, thank you very much. Um, oh. Nick. Okay, well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to meet you guys. And uh, I really appreciate you um, uh, giving me this time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Because what, what a great start to our day. It's exactly. Brilliant we'll start to the day. Yes. <laughs> All right. So for uh, sunrise, listeners, sunset. <laughs> perfect. For our listeners, supernalmagazineaustralia.com.au. 
go to drn1.com.au uh, to catch up with uh, our podcasts and what's going on and drn1 with uh, one life uh, give us 24 hour beautiful music to meditate to and to sleep to so uh, check them out check out the magazine all the content's free and uh, between now and next time have a supernal week and thanks to jeff Cantor for introducing us absolutely absolutely, absolutely. all right absolutely. Uh, thank you very much thank you